In this video, we're looking at the hypothesis test for the mean mu when the population standard deviation is known. It follows on from a couple of videos on the basics of hypothesis testing, which I am going to recommend you watch if you're a newbie to all this, as it'll help develop your intuition around some of these complex concepts. There'll be a link in the description for that. But here though, we're going to jump straight into an example to learn by doing. Now don't be put off by the length of this question. It's a classic hypothesis testing scenario. So let's give it a read. The manager of a department store is thinking about establishing a new billing system for the store's credit customers. She determines that the new system will be cost effective only if the mean monthly account is greater than 70 bucks. And so we've got a random sample here of 200 accounts with a mean value of $74. And we're also given this sneaky piece of information saying somehow the manager knows that the accounts are normally distributed with a standard deviation of 30 bucks. Now, in reality, it's unlikely to know the true population standard deviation. But in introducing the concept of hypothesis testing, we start by making all these simplifying assumptions and we're going to relax them a little bit later. The question is, is there enough evidence at the 5% level of significance to conclude that the new system will be cost effective? Now, if you want to give this a go yourself, I'd suggest pausing the video and then you can just fast forward to the end to see if you get the right answer. But I'm going to present this in a very structured fashion as per my step-by-step -step guide to hypothesis testing in those previous videos. So let's get straight to it. The first step is to state our null and alternate hypotheses. Now, these are often given the symbols H0 and H1. And this is potentially the most difficult part of the whole operation. Often it's difficult to determine exactly what is being tested. So let's have a look at these couple of lines. It says, she determines the new system will be cost effective only if the mean monthly account is greater than $70. And the question is, can we conclude that it will be cost effective? So my hot tip for creating null and alternate hypotheses is to put whatever you are seeking evidence for in the alternate hypothesis. So here we're trying to seek evidence that the true population monthly account value is greater than $70. And that goes in our alternate hypothesis, meaning that our null hypothesis is simply that it's equal to $70. Now, some people might like putting mu is less than or equal to $70 in the null hypothesis, but really that just depends on the particular convention. The important thing to note though, and I'll repeat this, the thing we are seeking evidence for goes in the alternate hypothesis. Now, why is that? Well, if we're seeking evidence for something, but start with that as our null hypothesis, the mere fact that we can't reject that null hypothesis is not a very strong statement, is it? So rather what we do, if we're trying to seek evidence that the mean is greater than 70, is start with the assumption that it's not greater than 70. Let's start with the assumption or the hypothesis that it is in fact exactly equal to 70. And let's see if we've got the information to reject that. And in doing so, we'd make a very strong statement in favor of it being greater than $70. So hopefully you can see then that whatever we seek evidence for needs to be in the alternate hypothesis. So really what's happening here is that under the assumption the null hypothesis is true, there's gonna be some distribution about the possible sample mean values. So there's a distribution with a mean of 70, and we actually have a sample mean of 74. So really the question we're gonna be answering is how extreme is that 74 value? Is that value so extreme that it will cast doubt on our null hypothesis? Well, that's what a hypothesis test effectively does. And in our next step, when we calculate the test statistic, we'll be quantifying how extreme our sample is. But first, let's just write down the information that we have. There's X bar, which is our sample mean at 74. The population standard deviation is 30, and we have 200 observations in our sample. Now, because sigma is known, we can use Z as our test statistic. And putting in all that information into the Z formula there, we can find that Z equals 1.8856. Now, as I've said in previous videos, this is some indication of how extreme our test statistic is, that's 74, if the null hypothesis was true. And the higher the Z value, the more extreme our sample is. 
So the more doubt then it casts on our null hypothesis. But at what point do we say, you know what, that's too much doubt on our null hypothesis? Well, that's where the decision rule comes in. So if the null hypothesis was true, our test statistic should be distributed normally with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we'd be expecting a Z value of zero, but of course, due to random variation in our sample, we'd allow a little bit of tolerance either way. But this is where the level of significance comes into play. For a 5% level of significance, we can construct for ourselves this rejection region above which lies 5% of the distribution. So that means that if our test statistic is so extreme that it's in the upper 5% of possible values, we're going to reject that null hypothesis and say, you know what, our sample's now too extreme. Now, how do we get this value? You can use tables to find this, and feel free to look in the description for my video on using distribution tables. But no doubt we can use Excel as well. So here's the formula that Excel will require for you to calculate a Z critical value. It's norm.s.inv, and inside that bracket, you put the cumulative distribution at that point, or the CDF. So I've put 0.95 in this Excel function here, because I know that at this point of interest, there's 95% of the distribution before it, as in to the left of it, leaving 0.5 above it. So when I put all this in, I get a Z critical value of 1.645 coming back at me. Great. So that means we're going to reject this null hypothesis if our Z value is greater than 1.645. Now you're very welcome to then go on to steps four and five, but I thought I might put a little step 3a in here just to discuss the concept of p-values because there's two kind of ways of coming at this. Now a p-value is the probability of getting a sample as extreme as ours, given the null hypothesis is true. So in our case, you can see we've got a value, a z value of 1.886. So really the question is, what's the probability of getting a test statistic equal to or greater than that. And using Excel, you can use the norm s dist function that provides for you the area to the left of a certain z value. So in this case, if I do norm s dist and I put 1.886, it'll provide for me the area to the left of 1.886. Of course, we need the area to the right. So we've got to go one minus that figure to get 0 0.03. Now this true value here that I've put into the norm s dist function just tells Excel that yes indeed I want the cumulative distribution function, the CDF. If you if you were to put false in there, you'll be getting what's called the PMF, the probability mass function, which is some measure of just the height at every given point, but we don't really need that at this point. True is where we want to be with this, so it gives us the area to the left of a certain z value. So we know that the p value then is 0 0.03. Step four then is to state our rejection decision. So using the rejection region we calculated first, we can say that we reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level of significance as Z is greater than 1.645. Or alternatively, given we've just calculated the P value, again, we can say that we reject the null hypothesis at that level of significance as P is less than 0.05. And with p-values, we know that we reject the null hypothesis if p is less than the level of significance, which in this case is 5%. Now, appreciate that these two methods of stating your rejection decision will always be in agreement with one another. They're exactly the same test, just looked at from a different perspective. This one looks at it from the perspective of the population mean or what we're testing it against. And this one comes at it from the point of view of the test statistic itself. And in either way, we're going to reject this null hypothesis. Leaving us with the conclusion that there is enough evidence at the 5% level of significance to suggest that the mean monthly account is greater than 70. So that means our sample mean was indeed far enough away from what we were testing against, that's $70, for us to reject this null hypothesis. Now appreciate that this was a one-tailed test. We were only ready to reject the null hypothesis if the sample mean was in one direction of that hypothesized mean, in the positive direction. 
Here's an example that's a little bit different. So I'll give you some time to have a read of that. And again, if you'd like to pause the video and come up with your own answer, you can see if we get the same answer. But we'll do a quick reading here. A new toll road is being built and financed on the expectation that 8,500 cars will use it per day. Now you've got to keep in mind that with these kind of expectations, it's actually bad if you overestimate or underestimate the number of cars that will use it. I mean, if you overestimate, then you're obviously not going to get as much money back from the tolls. But if you underestimate it, maybe you could have spent more money on the road itself or made more lanes or something like that. So it's quite important to get a reasonably accurate picture of how many cars use this toll road. So it says that in the first 30 days of the operation, a daily average of 8,120 cars were found to use it. So using the 1% level of significance, test whether the expectation was incorrect. And again, we've got that sentence, assume the distribution of road users is normally distributed with a standard deviation of 950. So I'm going to do this one a little bit quicker, but here's the null and alternate hypotheses. Appreciating that the alternate hypothesis is simply that it's not equal to 8,500. That's what we're seeking evidence for in this case. So it goes in our alternate hypothesis. So we would be rejecting that null hypothesis either way, whether our sample mean is significantly more or significantly less than 8,500. And our sample mean we got was 8,120. So is that far enough away from 8,500 for us to reject that null hypothesis? Well, let's find out. The first thing we can do is calculate the test statistic as we did last time. There's X bar, sigma, and N, and we find a Z value of minus 2.191. Now, is that gonna be in our rejection region? Well, here's our decision rule. Again, it's gonna be a Z distribution or a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But there are two differences in this example. Firstly, we know it's a 1% level of significance. But secondly, we know it's a two-tailed test. So that 1% rejection region needs to be split into the two sides, leaving 0.005 or 0.5% in each tail. So you have to be on your guard with these types of questions. If the alternate hypothesis is simply that it's not equal to some hypothesized value, then it has to be a two-tailed test. And to get this critical value, 2.576, I can use the norm.s.inv function again. But it's a little bit difficult to figure out what to put in here. Technically, to find this value of 2.576, I need to tell Excel, well, find me the Z value below which lies 0 0.995. So even though this is a 1% level of significance, this value here has to be 0 0.995 to get the appropriate point above which lies 0 0.005, and that's 2.567. So we're going to reject this time if Z is greater than 2.567 or less than negative 2.567. So we can calculate the p-value again, noting that it's the probability of getting a sample as extreme or more extreme than ours, given the null hypothesis is true. So here's our Z statistic, minus 2.191. So if we wanted to find that shaded region below it, then we can use this norm.s.dist function to find that at 0 0.0142. But given this is a two-tailed test, we have to appreciate that we can be more extreme than this test statistic in either direction. So values up here on the positive side are technically more extreme than ours as well. So for a two-tailed test, you have to make sure you multiply this area by two and there we get a p-value of 0 0.0285. So again, our rejection decision, we either do not reject the null hypothesis looking at our Z statistic because it's between minus 2.567 and 2.567, or we can say we do not reject because the p-value is greater than 0 0.01, realizing that it's the 1% level of significance we're using here. So our conclusion here is that there's not enough evidence at the 1% level of significance to suggest that the daily average of cars using the road is different from 8,500. Now this brings up a really interesting point because it seems like it's a double negative. 
not enough evidence to suggest it's different, and it has to be a double negative. You cannot here say that we have evidence for the null hypothesis. You can never find evidence in favor of your null hypothesis. You either reject it or you don't reject it. Be careful of ever saying the word accept your null hypothesis. You can never accept your null hypothesis. And I guess that gives us some intuition as to why whatever we're seeking evidence for goes in our alternate hypothesis. Remember that from the beginning? We can never really conclude any evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. So whatever we're seeking evidence for, we put in the alternate hypothesis. But in this case, we couldn't reject that null hypothesis. So there you have it. There's testing for mu when sigma is known. The next video will be for when sigma is unknown, which in my mind is quite a bit more realistic. I'm Justin Zeltzer and this is Z Statistics. Here's some links to keep in touch.